Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Emily Silva. I'm the NECAN coordinator. This is the second webinar in the 2023 NECAN webinar series on monitoring priorities for the Northeast. Um, with the assistance of this webinar series and our presenters, the NECAN steering committee will be working on the development of a regional monitoring plan for OA. And these webinars will serve as an informational resource for them as that plan um, comes together. So the primary audience for these webinars is the NECAN steering committee, um, but we also wanted to invite everybody in our community who would find these webinars to be helpful or informative to join us as well. There are currently nine webinars planned um, in the series and the schedule, speaker info, and other details will be periodically updated on our website and through our mailing list. Uh, so make sure you're signed up for our newsletter and check that page for this series. Um, right on the NECAN website under the resources tab, you'll find that. Today, we'll be hearing from Sarah Gaitchas, Tammy Silva, Jeremy Miller, and Jason Goldstein. At the conclusion of the presentations today, the steering committee will be asking our panel some questions, and then we'll open it up for a more general Q&A after that. So feel free to use the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen, um, or submit a question right into the chat, and we can um, ask your question for you if you're more comfortable with that. So first we'll hear for, from Sarah. Uh, Sarah is a research fishery biologist at the NOAA Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole. She works on ecosystem modeling, integrated ecosystem assessment, and management strategy evaluation, and supports fishery management decision making. Um, so go ahead, Sarah, I'll let you share your screen. Thanks. Yeah, let's make sure this works. It's always... Perfect. Oh, you're muted now, Sarah. How about that now? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry. There's a Zoom. Every time I'm on the Zoom web browser, something is different. So I apologize. We don't use this regularly. <laughs> Um, thanks for pointing that out. And if you lose audio again, please do like wave at me or something. Um, so you should be seeing a slide that says ocean acidification in Northeast US state of the ecosystem reporting. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. And thanks for inviting me. I'm very interested to um, speak to this group and share with you what we're reporting right now. And I really look forward to how this group can help us improve on what we're reporting and bringing more of this information into fishery management. So first I wanna acknowledge my um, co-authors here. So Kim Bastille is central to bringing all the data together for this report. It's a huge job and she does it really well every single year. Our data is available online if people want to see it. Um, and so are all the components of our report, including technical documentation. So there's links to that at the end of this and Kim is the one who makes all of that happen. Garrett DePiper is an economist here. He leads the human dimensions section of this. Kim Hyde is a biological oceanographer who leads the climate risk section. Scott Large leads the ecosystem dynamics and assessment branch and helps make sure that we can bring all of this information together. Sean Lucy is the lead editor of the New England uh, State of the Ecosystem Report. And I'm the lead editor of the Mid-Atlantic State of the Ecosystem Report. Um, and Laurel Smith is leading our habitat section. I also want to acknowledge Brandon Muffley, who's council staff at the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, who is um, working very closely with us to help uh, really bring this information into the council process. So I'm going to be using the Mid-Atlantic report as an example today, but you, just for your awareness, we also have a report that goes to the New England Council. We also have about 70 people so far from at least 16 institutions who contribute to this report. So I really want to acknowledge all of the contributions that we get. So um, what is the report? So this, it, I'm intending to just give you an overview of the report and how ocean acidification is currently in it, and then we'll discuss what future uses and might look like. So the idea of this report is to really bring ecosystem information into the fishery management process. So we are linking our ecosystem indicators to management objectives 
this report is contextual information for decision making. It's not a report that says um, here is information that you should use to make a particular decision, but it's intended to give managers a context for all of their decision making. These reports have been evolving since about 2016. This is our sixth year producing the report, and these are intended to be a fishery relevant subset of what might be called a full ecosystem status report. So we are not trying to report on absolutely everything that's happening in the ecosystem, but really focus on things and target fishery managers as our audience. So it would look like a different report if it were for a different audience. So I'll start right off saying that. We do have an open science emphasis here. So we're trying to make the report as transparent as possible. We try to make all the data available, all the methods available. And Kim Bastille's written a really nice paper on that that's, that's linked at the end of this if you wanna see how we do that. And this report is used within the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's ecosystem process. And Brandon Muffley has written a nice paper describing how that is working. And in support of that, we have a risk assessment. Um, we've done some conceptual modeling and the council has recently finished a management strategy evaluation. I'll touch on each of those briefly here because these are management uses of the report. And I think ocean acidification information could inform any of these in the future. So what you're seeing there is the cover of our current report, which is about to be sent to the council this afternoon for presentation on April 5th to the Mid-Atlantic Council. Um, the themes of this report, we're trying very hard not to just make this a collection of indicators, but rather to integrate them. And we are definitely, I'm the first person to say, not there yet, but this is what we're working towards. So we'd like to be able to characterize ecosystem change from a fishery management lens. And so we emphasize three themes. One is multiple system drivers, the second is regime shifts, and the third is ecosystem reorganization. And they're described there, and we have these images in the report to try to help people understand that uh, individual indicators are actually working together to drive what we're seeing in the ecosystem. So something like ocean acidification is a very important indicator, but it's also gonna interact with other things. Um, if all these drivers are changing at the same time, you can get something called a regime shift, which for the purposes of this report is defined as a large abrupt and persistent change in the structure and function of an ecosystem. So not necessarily a shift just in a single indicator. And these regime shifts, of course, can change how the ecosystem is organized. And if that has happened, we definitely want to inform our fishery managers of it. So again, I'm not saying we're all the way there yet, but these are the goals for this report. So the report scale and figures, just so you can understand how we're reporting things to the councils right now. On the left-hand side of your screen is a map. And so, like I said, we have a Mid-Atlantic State of the Ecosystem Report. You'll see the acronym SOE repeated throughout here. And we have a New England State of the Ecosystem Report. And we have the spatial scale. Some of our indicators are at the scale of the whole um, map here, so the whole Northeast US coast but many of our indicators are focused on what we call ecosystem production units. So that would be the Mid-Atlantic Bight primarily for the Mid-Atlantic State of the Ecosystem Report. And that includes the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's Bank for the New England State of the Ecosystem Report. So each of these red things here is a link to our glossary of terms, our technical methods documentation, and some indicator data that it, um, are available online. And like I said, we are trying to make all of this available. The other thing to note is our figures. We try to have standardized figures for time series. Unfortunately, ocean acidification is not yet a time series in this report, but I'll show you what we are reporting. We would love to have it be a time series in the future, but for our time series indicators, what we, what we present are on the right-hand side of the screen. So you can see this is a change in a long shelf distance and depth for, the, um, for all of the species that are found on the Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl survey right now. So as you can see, they're moving basically um, along the shelf to the Northeast and into generally deeper water. So the standardized approach that we take is the time series itself is the black dots and the black line. If you see an orange line, that is a significant increase over 30 plus years. If you see a purple line, that is a significant decrease over 30 plus years. So we apply the standardized method to all of our time series indicators. If there's no line in color and just the black dots and the black line, that means either we did not detect a significant trend or the time series is less than 30 years long. So we're working on methods that are appropriate even if we have autocorrelation for time series less than 30 years, but at the moment our methods are most appropriate if the time series is long. So that's what we're sticking with. And then that gray background there at the on the side of, the, of each time series here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, that is the most recent 10 years of the time series, just so uh, people have a sense of what's been occurring most recently 
recently, no matter what the length of the time series. So we apply this standardized approach to a lot of our time series indicators. Um, the report itself is divided into two sections. One is performance relative to management objectives and the other is risks to meeting fishery management objectives. So under performance, we report, and I'll go into detail, but these are things like um, the federal fisheries are um, trying to achieve optimum yield and optimum is defined in terms of maximum benefit to the nations as um, in terms of seafood production, recreational opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. That's in the governing legislation. Things like profits, community stability, um, and protected species are all very important objectives. So we have indicators that align with these objectives and we report on them in the first section of the report. I think I just saw a thing in the chat asking if we can um, link to our website. Absolutely, I can I can get you that, but I, and I can certainly address that um, in more detail. Just can't see the chat at the same time. Uh, for the risks to meeting fishery management objectives, this is where our ocean acidification indicators currently are. And we do a bulleted list of what we um, think is most important to communicate to fishery managers here. Right now, these are divided into climate and ecosystem risks and other ocean uses risks. And at the moment, that is um, offshore wind development. So I'll go into detail into each of these here. The summary of our current report that is just being released to the councils um, basically today and will be presented next week or in two weeks is, um, is here. And so we try to do this sort of report card style um, report for the performance relative to management objectives. So you can see that our indicators for seafood production and profits are both showing declining trends and are below the long-term averages. And then we have an implication section that we talk about what this means, why we think it is happening, what might be the drivers in order to try to help interpret those for fishery managers. For recreational opportunities, effort and effort diversity have kind of mixed trends, but fishery, fishery recreational opportunities are declining in diversity. And so that means there's maybe a smaller range of opportunities, even though effort has been equal. We see we have several indicators of stability in both the fishery and ecological realms, and those are kind of mixed right now. Um, we report on social and cultural objectives, including fishing engagement and, and reliance by community, and as well as environmental justice vulnerability by community. And then for protected species, there's two main objectives. That's maintaining bycatch of those species below thresholds, and those are generally being met in the region. And there's also recovering endangered populations. And I think many of you know that the North Atlantic right whale population is on a declining trend right now and below the long-term average. So, so that's one that still needs some work. Um, the, for the risks to meeting fishery management objectives, again, this is where our current ocean acidification indicators are. Um, obviously, they come under climate, warming, changing oceanography. The highlights that we give to the council are here on the bulleted list. We're seeing heat waves and Gulf Stream instability. A lot of habitats from estuarine to offshore are affected and there's a range of species responses. I'll show you an example of that. Um, we have distribution shifts that are complicating management and we do see poor conditioning and declining productivity for some of our fish stocks. I'll point out here that our, so the, it, to make the bulleted list, it has to be a really big headline, right? This, this report is approaching 50 pages, but we try to do a summary in the first two pages for fishery managers, understanding that they may not have time to read the details of the entire report. Ocean acidification definitely makes our bulleted list. So it's actually the fourth bullet down, and I know it's probably hard to read, but it says ocean acidification in Western Long Island Sound, near shore to mid shelf waters of the Mid-Atlantic Bight off the coast of New Jersey and in waters deeper than a thousand meters may impact organisms. So that's the summary of what we have in there right now. But uh, you'll notice that what we're trying to do is report on acidification and its impact to the managed species. So, that, so we are trying to make that connection. The other thing we report on are the other ocean uses. So wind, uh, again, here, this is a report for fishery managers. So we're not trying to say there will be no benefits from offshore wind development. What we are trying to do is highlight what some of the risks might be to meeting fishery management objectives. And those include the fact that there's quite a bit of revenue um, by port and managed species in the proposed areas, that there's going to be different impacts for species, depending on whether they prefer hard or soft bottom that there are overlap with right whale foraging areas and there's um, going to need to be mitigation for scientific surveys. So that's the summary of the whole report. Um, again, like I said, ocean acidification is currently included in our uh, risks, climate risks to meeting fishery management objectives. And at what we tend to present it, this exact slide is gonna go to the council. It's already been reviewed by the Scientific and Statistical Committee for the Mid-Atlantic Council. 
So it, this, is, this is what the indicator looks like when we present it. So we have cold pool indices, we have warm core rings, and then we have ocean acidification for our offshore habitat indicators. And it was a really nice job um, put together by Grace Saba and Shannon Misek for this contribution. They went through and they looked at specific thresholds for aragonite saturation for certain species. Um, sea scallop and longfin squid are highlighted in this report. We have Atlantic cod and lobster are highlighted, I think, in the New England report. So very important species for fisheries. And what they've done is not just shown where the bottom aragonite saturation state has been higher or lower, which is the plot um, in the bottom left-hand side of the screen, but also where those saturation states are actually um, hitting the range where these animals are sensitive. And that range is different for different animals. So they did an excellent job summarizing this research. And this is exactly the sort of information we wanna bring into the fishery management process on these risks that may not have been captured anywhere else um, in the process. So you can see the summary there is that this has been happening um, several times over the past decade. Like I said, we don't have a time series of this yet. And I think that would be wonderful if we could get that sort of thing and then be able to tie it to these sensitivity ranges. And any interactions we have between ocean acidification and other oceanographic indicators would also be something that we would want to be able to communicate. At the moment, they're presented sort of alongside each other, but the interactions between them are, are less well understood. So we summarize all this by um, a, a risk assessment approach for the Mid-Atlantic, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment, but the Right now, um, we're looking at the risks of climate sensitivity for the species, and many of them are low or low moderate in the mid-Atlantic management arena, but a couple of them are moderate to high or high risk, and many of them have risks of distribution shifts. Um, so we try to take these indicators in the report and tie them to actual managed species. And I, since I just reviewed what some of those are, I won't go through all the details in this slide, but this slide does get presented to the fishery managers. So how do the managers use this? Um, again, for those not familiar, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council manages, um, has members from the states shown on the map there, everything from New York to North Carolina, and manages the species shown on the right-hand side here in different fishery management plans. So they have everything from shellfish to um, small pelagic species to predatory species that they manage. And their ecosystem approach to fishery management is patterned on integrated ecosystem assessment. And so they, they developed this um, along with their stakeholders through a process where they went and asked their stakeholders, hey, what do you think about management in general? Almost all of them said, we need to include the ecosystem in management more. And so they've been doing this as a collaboration um, since a visioning project in 2011. So they've been working on this for quite some time. The basic idea is um, for the integrated ecosystem assessment loop on the left-hand side of your screen is basically you start with your goals and targets, you develop indicators, assess the ecosystem, analyze uncertainty and risk and evaluate strategies. And then you kind of loop back through with your managers to say, have we got the right targets? Have we got the right indicators? How do we improve the assessment? How do we, if we've implemented management action, did it do what we wanted it to do? That kind of approach. So the Mid-Atlantic has actually adapted this on the right-hand side of their screen in their ecosystem approach. It's a stru structured decision-making framework basically where they prioritize. So back up, there's a lot going on in the ecosystem. I don't think I need to tell anyone that. And for fishery managers, it can seem kind of overwhelming when they're already managing a, a whole bunch of stocks. And so the idea is they prioritize some of the key ecosystem interactions using risk assessment. Then after that, they can refine down to a question, what is the key thing we need to look at for the highest risk things? And for that, you develop a conceptual model. And then finally, they use a management strategy evaluation, which I'll describe in a moment, to decide how we should deal with the problem that's been identified through this sort of layered process of risk assessment, conceptual modeling, and, and then analysis. Then you can loop back through with your implementation and monitoring and ask if this is working. So basically the ecosystem reporting that I just described is directly linked to the risk assessment in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, then that risk assessment is used in conceptual modeling to sort of highlight the links across these different issues that might be affecting a fishery or species. And then management strategy evaluation or the big sort of analytical uh, approach is going to be able to include these key risks as well. So it kind of all starts with the reporting and the information that we have there. 
So how does an ecosystem indicator, a time series specifically translate into risk? Here's one example. This is um, just commercial revenue, just for an example. And so um, the council has described both uh, risk levels and definitions for the risk levels for each of the indicators in their risk assessment. And for example, here, if you have a significant long-term revenue decrease, which is indicated, as you can see on the right-hand side with the purple lines for both, whether it's all species combined in the Mid-Atlantic or it's just the species that are managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council in red, they both have declining trends. So this would rank a moderate to high risk. Um, in their risk assessment. And basically it gets translated into this sort of orange, you know, that's relative, moderate to high risk. And in the state of the ecosystem report, we try to tie this together with our implication sections to say, okay, so commercial revenue, a lot of that is actually driven by benthic organisms, including surf clams and ocean cohogs. And so monitoring changes in climate and landings can be really important. So for instance, in the climate risk element, surf clams and ocean cohogs are considered highly sensitive to ocean warming and acidification. That was key in the risk assessment done there. And we did note in a previous report that the pH in surf clam summer habitat was approaching, but not yet at the one that was identified to affect growth in a lab experiment. So what we need to do is come back and tie this into the aragonite saturation that we're reporting this year. Either way, you can see how the risks are connected, even though they're individual um, indicators, we do try to connect those across the report for the managers. So what this is the result, basically, they, can, they get a risk assessment, basically a summary of all of the indicators they have across these risk elements that they are concerned about. And obviously I don't have time to go into all of these, but I'll just point out under species level risk elements, what you have here are the climate and distribution shift elements for each of the species that are managed by the Mid-Atlantic Council over here on the top left-hand side of the screen. Those climate elements, the climate risk is what currently includes ocean acidification in this report right now. And that comes from the climate vulnerability analysis that was done in this region and published in 2016 with John Hare as the lead author. And so, the information in there on sensitivity to ocean acidification is basically the one place where it's coming into this risk assessment right now. We have the opportunity in this year to update this risk assessment with the council. That's a process that has already started and will be ongoing for this year. And so my hope is if there's more um, direct in indicators or risks from ocean acidification for a particular species that we can update these risk elements here with new information that we have. And in the future, if there's a time series, we could even use something like that. So then to just finish, close the loop here, the way the Mid-Atlantic Council used the risk assessment is they did identify summer flounder as a high risk fishery for conceptual modeling. And you're seeing the conceptual model there on the right-hand side of the screen. I'll just note that something like a distributional shift is the thing that is really connected to a lot of other risk elements for summer flounder. But I will also note that ocean acidification is included in this. So the, the idea of having the, all these indicators in this ecosystem approach is you can sort of hone in on a particular question, like say recreational fishery discards for summer flounder, but you can still take a look across all of your indicators and see which ones are gonna be most important to that question. So for this particular one, summer flounder recreational discards, ocean acidification is not necessarily the first one I would pick. However, distributional shifts were included in the management strategy evaluation because they're so impactful for this fishery. So management strategy evaluation, you can look at the, all the details here later, is basically a, a simulation analysis. You simulate an ecosystem and the interactions within it, and then you simulate the management that you want to do, and you feed it back into the simulated ecosystem, and you ask over time, is this actually achieving our objectives? It's nice to be able to do this because you can't really break something, um, and you can test out lots of things that may or may not be feasible, but you can figure out how they work and what the likely risks are, and so this is what we did for the summer flounder. And this is where information on ocean acidification could come in in the future for a lot of these species. You would have it in the ecosystem and maybe not necessarily understanding that in management and see how things might play out, right? So this is a great way to include information and do what if analyses. In the Mid-Atlantic Council, suffice it to say, we looked at each one of these plots is something someone cares about out of the fishery. 
And each one of these plots looks across seven different ways of managing the fishery. So that's your y-axis here. And um, higher numbers are generally better. And green here in all of these plots all the way to the left-hand side is what we're doing right now. And so this, this basically shows you with management strategy evaluation how well you can do with other management um, measures. And the, the key thing here is including the ecosystem didn't really change the rank order of how well the management measures did. It's these squares here. What it did was um, distribution shifts actually diminished the amount of benefit you might get from any one of them. And so you can include things like ocean acidification, distribution shifts, et cetera, in an analysis like this and ask, does that make our management expectations different? And so again, a lot of detail here, but you don't, that was the main take home point. And so to conclude, I think the way we might wanna use this information in the future and this type of reporting and to the fishery management councils is there's several species and also system level decisions where this information might be really useful. So for instance, the Mid-Atlantic Council already includes that climate vulnerability analysis when we consider the scientific uncertainty for establishing acceptable biological catch. Um, I go through every year and I say, hey, we've got this vulnerability report. Were these animals sensitive or highly sensitive or not sensitive? And that, that plays into our thoughts on scientific uncertainty. Um, we do have the OA sensitivity in there already, and we're starting to understand the thresholds for individual species in our current reporting. So I would love to have reports. More a little bit. Sorry. Oh, I was, was there a question? Oh, okay, never, well, yeah, sorry, we can come back to that, I'm, I'm about done. So basically, um, I'm hoping if we can get something like more regional reporting, there would be the potential to consider these time series even in a stock assessment. Um, at the moment, it's hard to do that with uh, the type of information that we have right now. Then there's also habitat climate vulnerability assessment that was just finished, and we are reporting on aspects of that in our, in our ecosystem reports as well. Um, it would be really great to include ocean acidification and things like that. And then also um, just thinking about multi-species metabolic indices to identify areas where things might be better or worse for individual managed species. So really the idea here is to keep working together on decision processes that can use this information. And I think what's going in the Mid-Atlantic Council is working really well right now. It's collaborative and iterative. We don't expect to have all the answers at once, but we are including what we have right now in our ecosystem reporting in our risk and vulnerability assessments. And this is these are useful tools to use the information we have right now. I think ultimately what we'd love to be able to do is understand um, productivity change for different species in the system and be able to communicate that to managers. And so um, I, I'll leave you with that goal. Thank you, that's, that's all I got. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so next up, we'll hear from Dr. Tammy Silva. Um, Tammy is a research marine ecologist at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. She serves as the climate lead for the sanctuary and is involved in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries Climate Science and Assessment Working Group. Her current work focuses on movement, behavior, and ecology of top predators and their prey. Tammy earned her PhD and master's from the U University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and her bachelor's from Stonehill College. Um, go ahead, Tammy, you wanna share your screen? Yes, thank you, Emily. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. I had this issue the other day where when I share my screen, I get muted. How's that? We can hear you, but I can't see what you're sharing. Okay. How about now? Uh, no, that looks like the same here, but not see. It says you have started screen sharing, but we can't see your slides. Yeah, it's like a black screen. Hmm. It might just be a delay. I thought I saw it start to flash up there um, the last time. Okay. Maybe just wait a second here. 
Um, I'll give it a minute, but I'll I'll start talking. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here today, and thanks for inviting us to join in on this important conversation. So today I'll be focusing on uh, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary and kind of its status with respect to ocean acidification, our current knowledge of the current state of OA in our sanctuary, a lot of it based on our 2020 condition report. And I'll talk about a few important studies that focused on OA in a little more detail and then wrap up with what we think uh, OA monitoring plan uh, in the sanctuary might look like and how we'd use that information. Any luck with the slides popping up? Yep, we can see your title slide now. Oh, perfect, okay. So just to start uh, by giving a little bit of context nationally and regionally. So here's a map of the sanctuary system, 15 national marine sanctuaries, um, now two national marine monuments and two proposed sanctuaries there in yellow. Um, you can see Stellwagen Bank is the only sanctuary in the Northeast region, the only sanctuary in the Gulf of Maine. There we are off the coast of Massachusetts. And so given that we're the only sanctuary in this region, and also our status as an MPA and many of our long-term monitoring and research programs, which provide great data for tracking different things going on in the ecosystem, as well as the importance of our ecosystem services that come out of the sanctuary. We're really thinking that our site would be a great place, a, a sentinel site within the Gulf of Maine to monitor climate change and, and OA impacts. So I'll kind of start give the the summary of our current state of knowledge of OA here and then I'll dive into a couple of these bullets in a little more detail. So right now the sanctuary is currently buffered from the impacts of OA as is much of the Gulf of Maine but for how long we don't really know. Um, we have Calanus bimarchicus, a major zooplankton species and base of the food web here as well as the Gulf of Maine um, declining throughout the larger Gulf of Maine but seems to be doing okay here in the sanctuary. One question we have is what are the connections between the sanctuary and the rest of the Gulf of Maine in terms of Calanus, as well as other metrics. And we just started a newly funded project um, to look at connections between Calanus transport, um, as well as seasonal synchrony between the larger Gulf of Maine and the sanctuary. And that was funded by the NOAA Climate Program Office. We're just getting into that project now. Um, we've learned a lot about sandlance, a very important forage fish in recent years. And one thing we learned is that juvenile sandlance are or seem to be highly vulnerable to ocean acidification effects, which will or could have great impact on our ecosystem. And then lastly, we've had large increases in the scallop population on Stellwagen Bank in recent years, and we don't have a good handle on what influences that population in the sanctuary and whether they're vulnerable to OA. So much of what I'll talk about today, pretty much all of it, is in our 2020 condition report. Uh, this is where we um, document the status and trends of living resources in the sanctuary. We also look at habitat. We look at maritime heritage resources. We look at ecosystem services. And we report on the status and trend of each one of those things. Our condition report was published in 2020. But our expert working group that we convened to talk about these status and trends was actually in 2017. And so when our report came out, we wanted to also make sure we were aware of and reporting on some of the most recent and relevant sanctuary science that happened in that gap period. So we also um, wrote the state of the science report in 2020. And you can find uh, both of those documents. Sorry, I'm not changing my slide here. You can find both of those documents at the website below. Uh, we also have a climate change impacts profile for the sanctuary and you can find that on our headquarters website and there's also a climate impacts profile for each one of the sanctuary sites. So to jump into our condition report, again, there's about 15 questions in there that look at status and trends of a bunch of different things. But the two questions that are relevant for our, our OA discussion are here. So the first one was, have recent changes in climate altered water conditions and how are they changing? And I'll just highlight on the bottom that one of the outcomes 
of that was that monitoring, um, more monitoring was needed to robustly identify acidification trends and effects. And then the other question was, what is the status of keystone and foundation species and how is it changing? One of the species we looked at here was sand lance and because they are so place-based, they depend on sand um, and they're, uh, they show highly um, unpredictable fluctuations in local abundance. It's unclear exactly how they will fare in a climate change scenario. So now I'll detail uh, two studies that kind of informed both of these questions. So the first one was a, a dedicated study looking at deep water OA within the sanctuary. This happened quite a few years ago now and in, in starting in 2011, but this is really the only dedicated study on OA to our knowledge that's happened within the sanctuary. We were involved in the project as well as a number of partners, UNH, HUI, uh, UMass Dartmouth with funding from NIRACUS and the Mass LNG Deepwater Port Mitigation Fund. So here we leveraged the existence of the North Atlantic right whale passive acoustic monitoring buoys that line the shipping lane that transverses the sanctuary. You can see that in the bottom left panel. And we actually attached a benthic OA observatory to one of the buoys, which you can see in the figure on the right. So the observatory was deployed in about 83 meters of water in Stellwagen Basin. There were two deployments that were about six months each and the observatory had a, a bunch of sensors there, you can see in the bottom part of that slide. And so here are the results of that preliminary study. Here's a plot of omega or aragonite saturation. You can see the red line there is actually from the Niracus buoy in the surface waters near the Isle of Shoals. And the blue line is what came off of the Stellwagen Benthic Observatory. So we saw this decoupling of the benthic and surface waters that corresponded to around the time of the spring bloom. And then here, of course, you have omega values less than 1.6 could start to lead to poor shell formation. So from this, we saw very different dynamics in surface versus deep water. All of that also corresponded with a decline in pH and, and uh, calcium carbonate. And so we had this one brief study, and this is where we concluded that we need some more monitoring to figure out really what's going on with OA in the sanctuary. So now I'll jump over to sand lance. So sand lance are a really key forage fish for us. They really drive what goes on in the ecosystem in terms of top predators within the sanctuary. And we've learned a lot about sand lance over the last three years in our study that was funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to look at the ecology and productivity of sand habitat, which we did through the lens of sand lance since they're such an important component of sand habitat. So what we know about sand lance uh, in relation to OA comes from two studies conducted by Hannes Bauman and Chris Murray at the University of Connecticut. Um, and both studies used sand lance that were captured on Stellwagen Bank during the spawning period. They were then, uh, those embryos were then raised in the lab at varying conditions in terms of temperature and CO2. And so uh, Chris Murray's study was the preliminary work shown in the left figure where he showed a decline in sand lance hatching success with increasing temperature and increased CO2. And so then Hannes Bauman followed up with a more extensive study a few years later, which was just published last year uh, in MAPS and found that hatching success declined uh, in response to increasing CO2 regardless of temperature. And when you compare these results with sand lance for other uh, species that have been looked at, it seems that sand lance are extremely sensitive to uh, CO2 concentrations increasing. One other piece of the 2022 paper um, looked at seasonally explicit projections of CO2 for Stellwagen Bank in the top left there. And there was some modeling of hatching success based on future levels of CO2. And Hannes found that the predicted rise in the winter uh, PCO2 concentration, which is when sand lands are hatching, could reduce sand lands hatching by more than a quarter or to about 71% of current levels. And so 
that's really concerning and, and really important to us because again, sand lands are what really drive our ecosystem on Stellwagen Bank. They're the preferred prey for humpback whales, for great shearwaters, for commercially important fish like cod. So you have all of the impacts or potentially cascading impacts there, but again, a potential impact on scallops, which are another really important piece of the economy uh, within the sanctuary. In relation to sand lands, any impact from OA that would happen in the sanctuary could also ripple throughout the Gulf of Maine and Southern New England. Another piece of our work, which you can see in the figure on the right, um, based on some modeling of um, and forward tracking of particles simulated to be sand lance larvae, uh, it looks like sand lance that hatch on Stellwagen Bank are actually transported to the south, so around the backside of Cape Cod to the Great South Channel and to Southern New England. So anything impacting sand lands on Stellwagen Bank, like OA, could affect areas further downstream. So the Deepwater OA study and the sand lands work are really the only two dedicated OA research that we've had within the sanctuary. And so one of the things we're proposing to do, this is something that's in the works right now, is to uh, create this climate sentinel mooring on on Stellwagen Bank. And this project and proposal is being led by Ben Haskell at our site, as well as Jake Kritzer at Miracus. And so we're proposing to transition one of the existing national uh, data buoy center buoys, which is in the southwest, cor uh, southeast corner of the sanctuary there, uh, the yellow dot, and transition that to a long-term uh, kind of ecosystem monitoring buoy. And you can see there all of our partners on the bottom. And so the purpose of this would be to understand ecosystem dynamics, but it would also enable us to detect any climate change signals, uh, weather reporting, and gather real-time data for other responses. Uh, like so here's an example of what that shifting the current location into our dedicated habitat research area, so just a little bit further north. Here's a schematic of what the mooring would look like, and then some possible sensors and observations that could come off that buoy. Um, things like temperature, uh, salinity, and then chemical profiles like oxygen, pH, PCO2, kind of these standard measurements, and some other sensors that would let us get at other areas of ecosystem dynamics. So to, to wrap up here, what we would envision a monitoring plan within the sanctuary to look like, again, based on its location, its value to the, the region and our long-term monitoring programs, we kind of consider the sanctuary a sentinel site for monitoring climate change impacts. But we also want to know and understand connections between the sanctuary and the larger region. How would we use these data? We would certainly include them in condition reports and management plans. Those are our two guides for everything that the sanctuary does. It would allow us to prioritize our resources and things like our proposed climate sentinel buoy would also provide an, an early warning system for sanctuary users like fishermen or whale watch companies at what kind of conditions are coming down the pike, how that could impact them. We'd like to monitor things like pH, CO2, temperature, alkalinity, and oxygen. And we think it's important to couple those observations with our continued ecosystem monitoring. So since 2013, we've done surveys for sand lance, seabirds, and marine mammals at 44 sites within our sanctuary. And we think it's important to keep that type of monitoring going so that we uh, can link it to current environmental conditions coming from new monitoring programs. Ideally, we'd like to look at all sanctuary habitats, so not only the deep water west of the bank in Stellwagen Basin, where the OA study took place, but also on top of the bank, as well as in benthic and surface water, so we really get the full picture of what's happening in all habitats. Seasonal monitoring would be at minimum, given that um, split in benthic and surface water we saw in our preliminary study, but monthly monitoring would be ideal given the, the types of shifts and seasonal patterns and distributions of different species in the sanctuary. And again, we have no existing monitoring program, so this would be a, a new need for us and something that we hope the proposed uh, buoy with a near real-time data stream would start to fill. 
and uh, that's all I have today. So again, thank you. Thanks for inviting us and looking forward to the conversation later. Thanks, Tammy. Um, yes, yeah, so next up, we'll hear from Jeremy Miller. Um, Jeremy has been at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve since 2004 and coordinates their system-wide monitoring program, which is a NOAA-funded long-term environmental monitoring program in place at all 30 NERS since 1995. Jeremy oversees the collection of continuous water quality and weather data, as well as monthly nutrient sampling and also assists with a number of biological monitoring projects. He's a graduate of the University of New England in Biddeford, where he received a double major in environmental science and marine biology in 2003. His focus is on the technical side of instrumentation and data collection, both in the field and in the lab. He's also joined today by Jason Goldstein, who is also from Wellsner. Uh, go ahead, Jeremy. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for having us um, here on the webinar series. There's a couple of great talks and really impressed by how um, tightly correlated we're able to get some of this OA information into management uses from the fishery side of things. And that's really impressive. Um, I wanna, can everyone see my screen okay? We got my slide up there, all right? See we can I see can. your screen, yep, uh, but it's, it's not in presenter mode. Okay, how's that look, better? Yep. So I want to take a little step back and pull us back a little closer to our shore here. And um, because we're from the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, I want to talk to folks a little bit today about our existing infrastructure and programs that we have in place with the NEARS uh, monitoring some of our environmental parameters and also how we can hopefully incorporate some ocean acidification parameters into that to, to more accurately monitor carbon chemistry in our coastal systems. So of course, um, some of the talks we heard today, Stellwag and Banks, some of the data coming from the, the fisheries reports, um, open ocean systems are of course uh, much more stable than our local estuarine systems um, that are receiving a lot of freshwater input. So maybe uh, this talk will give a little bit of a, a different twist on this coastal um, acidification question that we're really trying to get at to tie in with what's happening out in the more open ocean proper with ocean acidification. So just really quickly who we are, we are funded under NOAA's Ocean uh, Office of Coastal Management. There are 30 reserves. We have a new uh, Connecticut reserve at Avery Point um, that just opened up. We're excited to have them on board. So our New England coverage continues to increase with the near system, which is great. You can see we have reserves in Maine, uh, Wells, Great Bay, New Hampshire, Wilcoit Bay, Massachusetts. And again, new one coming out in Connecticut as well as Rhode Island um, out on Prudence Island. So good coverage um, and also around the country too. And again, uh, all these reserves are kind of trying to do the same data collection the same way through the system-wide monitoring program, which I'll talk a bit about in a second. We're located down here in the southern coast of Maine and Wells. No one's ever visited our site. We are a very site-based place. Um, we have this awesome site um, that's an old saltwater farm, 1,600 acres to come and visit. You can see the, the Little River Estuary in the background is one of the estuaries that we study, as well as the larger uh, Web Webhannet River um, estuary. And this star is where a lot of our continuous monitoring work has been um, happening historically and both currently with our efforts in monitoring um, some OA parameters. And you can see up in the background is the Little River Estuary up here and our site um, is just there in the background as well. So we're kind of nestled between these two estuaries. So a beautiful site if you can get down there. And all reserves are basically protected for the same major functions. We have a stewardship program, a research and education programs, and also coastal training programs. Um, that we're trying to uh, get this information again from the science sector into the management sectors to use in coastal decision making. So I can see a lot of connections with future OA deliverables in our, our coastal training program as well. So a little bit about our system-wide monitoring program. That's what I'm um, in charge of at the reserve. Again, this has been in place um, at most reserves since 1995. Um, we are uh, tasked with uh, running at least four long-term water quality monitoring stations in our estuaries, which are sampling every 15 minutes for a, a suite of water quality parameters. Um, we have an associated National Weather Service station as well on site collecting 15 minute meteorological data. And again, this stuff's been coming in following a pretty stringent NOAA um, um, policy since 1995. We like to think that we're collecting uh, a pretty accurate and, and precise data, data set because of those um, SOPs and things that have been in place for a long time. Um, the mission of our, our system-wide monitoring program, I think, says it nicely, to identify and track short-term variability, so seasonal patterns, storm impacts, things like that, but also long-term changes um, in the integrity and biodiversity of our estuarine ecosystems. And, of course, OA and climate change are some of those long-term changes that we're trying to kind of hone in on now. 
Um, just to mention a few of the parameters that, again, that we're collecting, we're using XO2 um, data sons at all of our sites and have been since I think about 2009. We're using um, um, YSI 6600 units before that. So we've been um, working with this equipment for a long time. I like to think that we're, we're pretty well versed in how this equipment runs and uh, getting used to these sites after many, many years of dipping equipment. And um, I will start by just saying that, you know, when we're talking about monitoring data and collecting data on things like ocean acidification or carbonate chemistry. Um, I always come from it again from the technical standpoint of the data that we're collecting and the information that we can glean from that data or management decisions we can make are only as good as the data we're collecting. And I'll get to that in a little bit because that's kind of where we're a bit hung up in the OA arena right now. But I think we're making great progress and groups like this are helping tremendously. But again, that 15 minute data coming in is, is pH, conductivity, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, both um, percent and milligrams per liter, um, things like turbidity, and we also have a chlorophyll coming in on a couple of our sites. So again, I'm monitoring these continuously year round um, since 1995. Giving you a, a little snapshot of Wells Bay and where we're at here. Again, we have two systems, the Little River up above and the larger Webb Hannett, where you'll see that inlet and head of tide site. I'm going to focus in on this larger estuary for the purpose of this talk, because this is, again, where we've done most of our acidification or coastal acidification monitoring so far, and just make the point that these two different sites are picked on for a very uh, real reason. You know, we have sites in our estuaries at both the mouth of the site, so very close to the open ocean or the inlet of our systems, and also up at the head of tide or as high up as we see tidal influence. Um, and this really impacts the type of data that we're seeing. And that's one thing I think we do have a really good handle on is how these smaller estuarine systems that are inputting into the larger Gulf of Maine um, are reacting to, to, to things like climate change, warming waters and shifts in pH, because we have a really sound data set on some of those environmental parameters so far. So I'd like to show you a little bit of pH data right now, because again, that's something we, I think we've been doing really well for a long time and have a great data set on. Um, this is pH data from the Webb Hannett River estuary, uh, kind of a tale of two sites here. So this is pH data from our head of tide site. So you can imagine this site is running um, sometimes fresh water for many days in a row, um, big tides will hit it. We'll see some salinities up to 16, sometimes 20 perch per thousand. But what I want you to look at here is you can see our pH at this site is generally ranging from about six and a half to seven and a half. That's where it likes to live, um, generally brackish to kind of fresh water pH ranges. But you see what happens here on October 25th um, through um, November 1st. We had pH readings down to 4.5 um, pH units at this site for many days. Um, and if I overlay our precipitation data from our local weather station that I run, um, you can see what caused that, right? We had a huge rain event with a lot of runoff after a long drought period. You remember 20, uh, 2021 was a pretty dry summer. So we had an amazing influx of fresh water and we saw our pH completely bottom out at the site. And it stayed that way for quite a few days um, until it rebounded back up into the six to seven range. So um, these inputs from freshwater sources, I think they're a very real source of acidic waters um, getting into the uh, Gulf. And I think understanding some of these more inland sites, brackish sites or estuarine sites could be really beneficial or interesting to our coastal um, knowledge of coastal acidification and how that's functioning. And just for comparison, I wanted to show you that same time period at our inlet site. So remember that's the site closer to the ocean, less impacted from that freshwater runoff, but sure enough, um, if you see that blue line representing our pH levels there at the inlet, we see those dips on those associated low tides when that, that fresh water runoff is going to suck down, down through the estuary, out to the mouth of our system, and we were dropping our pHs there at the harbor, which generally hover around eight, um, down into the low sevens. Um, so we do see that on certain occasions. So interesting to see how those two sites are, are kind of um, seeing these two very different salinity regimes. And um, this gets to the point, of course, of data collection and how accurate and precise we need our pH data to be. Because in some systems like the open ocean, we may be seeing a, a pretty small range of pH fluctuations on a daily basis. But boy, in our estuaries, we are seeing some pretty wild swings. So um, we'll be really interesting to see how all of this stuff ties into the bigger picture of ocean acidification. I hope that's where some of our data can help others. So where am I getting all this data and looking at it? Um, all this data is available online. So we have had a great relationship with the University of South Carolina, which runs a department called the Centralized Data Management Office. Um, their mission is to oversee the management, documentation, and publication of all of our NEARS monitoring data to the internet. So that uh, NEARSdata.org, if you can just remember our acronym, N-E-R-R-S, which stands for the National Estuary Research Reserve System. It's a mouthful. The NEARSdata.org gives you access to all of our data. 
And um, they're also providing those um, data backups, QAQC protocols, and again, that internet access to swap. And I just wanted to show you guys a little bit of what that looks like online um, when you go to the CDMO and visit our website. And again, we encourage folks to do this because this is data being collected, uh, of course, with NOAA funds, tax dollars, and this data is out there for the public and scientists and researchers to use. Um, and we get a lot of that, a lot of querying. So if you're into pH data from New England, we have some really great data sets from our, from our New England NEARS. So there's three basic ways to interface or access that data. We have our data export system, which is shown by the map up in the right-hand corner here, shows all our reserves. You can click on it, narrow down into individual stations. Once you pick your stations, you can kind of see what data is coming off those stations. Most of our stations are equipped with real-time telemetry systems, so we can see our data in near real time about an hour after it's been collected. You can grab the last 24 hours of a parameter, or you can also dive in and grab large chunks of data um, our advanced query system, which if you look at the lower left, that second option, allows researchers to go in and um, kind of uh, hand select or a la carte their data. They can grab turbidity data from one station, pH data from three stations, and nutrient data and get it all packaged in one data set. A little bit um, um, more uh, difficult to navigate, but if you're used to those kind of database query things, you should be good. And we also have real-time data applications, again, that show our station um, stuff coming off. And, and again, pretty easy um, to whip up some, some graphs um, for presentations and stuff. Um, all of this stuff is done right online. This is just a quick graph showing you water temperature and tides at our, at our inlet station and how that data is inverse, obviously. But um, real simple way of accessing and looking at our data. So just want to plug that one more time for folks to access and use this data in their, in their coastal studies. So... Our swamp data is, I think, really what we do well and, and the applications for it are many. We have a lot of folks who are tapping into our data and using it. Um, generally falls into these categories of informing or complementing other research and monitoring that happens at our site. So when folks come into the reserve and want to study something, they're always really excited to know that we have this great resource of, um, of, of data. But we also work with emergency response, community engagement education and outreach. So just some quick examples. Um, we've been working with our local emergency management authority since 2012 with storm level impact. So we have uh, accurate water level data as well as wind direction speed. So we can tell when roads are flooding um, in, in, in for search and rescue operations. So that's been a really boots on the ground use of our data. But our data is also ingested into the state of Maine into what's called their EGAD system, an environmental and geographical analysis database. Our nutrient data has been used for TDML thresholds um, by that group. Um, all water quality and weather data is ingested in the system for regional synthesis and management decisions. And I know that uh, the DEP is getting into SAVs and starting to look at submerged aquatic vegetation, which OA has um, some major impacts on. So I know I'm presenting a more streamlined and accurate um, data stream on any OA parameters would be really helpful for these types of organizations. So um, this kind of sets the pace for why, why OA monitoring, or why are we interested in, in collecting this stuff in our system? So we feel like the existing research, at least a lot of the published science on OA is just that ocean acidification and open ocean systems. And um, maybe this coastal ocean acidification and estuaries is, is a little less known. Um, we're, we're still trying to put our minds around how things like productivity and tidal fluxes and all that stuff are impacting what we're seeing with acidification in our estuaries. Um, and it's also, you know, been historically difficult to get funding for long-term monitoring like this. And I think that's changing, of course, in light of climate change and, and some of the changes we're seeing in our ecosystems. Um, and of course, our coastal systems are very vulnerable to these, uh, to both atmospheric CO2, um, but also the byproducts of everything that happens in our estuaries. So eutrophication, runoff from agriculture, coastal development. So SWAMP is already in place and funded um, through NOAA, and we've been collecting data on all of these other um, issues that are happening, uh, nutrient data, oxygen data, temperature salinity. So we really think we have a strong platform from which to kind of add in um, some carbonate chemistry monitoring. And our purpose right now is to work with others to figure out what those parameters should be, kind of figuring out the best bang for our buck and how to do that. So we got going down that path in 2020, 2021 with some funding from NOAA OCM um, to buy some PCO2 sensors to start doing some unattended sampling at our swamp sites. So we figure, again, we have the infrastructure in place. We have sites already out there. Um, we have personnel paid to go out and service these sites. Why not drop another sensor <laughs> in the water and see what we can find um, regards to PCO2? So Wells, Great Bay, Wakoy Bay, and Narragansett all got these sensors in 2020. It's kind of a proof of concept to, to see how this would look 
running these units alongside YSI XO2 sensors. And we did that. We uh, built some cages you can see on the left there and our swamp sonde or our, our data loggers right off to the left there living in that tube in great need of a cleaning from that picture. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we collected about a year's worth of data. Um, we designed these cages, shipped them out to our partners. And this is where collaborations became really important. Um, you know, I wanna big, big thanks to Dr. Chris Hunt, who, I, who I'm sure a lot of you know um, on this call, as well as Mike Doan up at Friends of Casco Bay and Joe Salisbury at UNH, some, uh, some names in the regional OA work. Um, they've been huge in helping us kind of um, prove some of these um, equipment tests and really helping us understand our, our data that was coming back in because Mike had a couple of your time series already on what estrin PCO2 data might look like from a similar system. And of course, Chris is a wealth of knowledge on this subject. So I just wanted to show you a little bit of what that data looked like. And unfortunately, from this graph, you can see we had some severe learning curves um, to go through. And really, so far, the our assessment of our data has been less of assessing the data through the lens of ecosystem impacts because we're still trying to assess our data through the lens of is this credible data or not. And not having a ton of baseline data to compare that to um, has been really difficult. So you can see the different reserves here. And um, I, I'll just say, this is the nuts and bolts of this kind of stuff. We did not have a great run with these PCO2 sensors from Turner. Um, I don't know if anyone's on the call who has any great ties to Turner or Pro Oceanus or PNE. But we just had a really bad um, um, go with these. I will admit that these were right in the middle of the pandemic and um, supply chain shortages. And we kind of didn't pick the greatest time to start testing new equipment, but it was what it was. We had to keep moving. And what happened was you can see Great Bay got about one deployment <laughs> out of their unit before they started having issues. Narragansett got about two deployments and the thing failed them. We had a really good track run actually for quite a while with our unit but that unit also um, failed on us um, in early 2021. It gave us a lot of problems. And same thing with Wakoit Bay, had some real issues. These units went in and sat for sometimes five, six months before we even heard back from folks. So um, I wish we had a better PCO2 data set from that project, but there were some great lessons learned, namely about what our data looks like in situ and what kind of things affect um, PCO2 data, particularly when you're when you're trying to collect that, again, unattended in situ. One of the big things is following. So this is just a graph looking at some of the data that came off one of our stations. And you can see that things uh, line up and look really good until the end of the deployment where we start getting into some unreasonable numbers um, from what I found in the literature and, and Dr. Hunt could infer. And that was from following in the cage. So again, working in these estuaries where there's a lot of productivity, a lot of following, a lot of organic material, um, we really have to be cognizant of how we're deploying these, where we're deploying these, being very specific about the way that we collect some of this data to make sure that we're getting an accurate representation of the system. And again, just to preface that, you know, our water quality data goes back to 1995. We have some really good time series and products that that show that these um, some of the trends that we're seeing more in the open ocean environment, like the Gulf of Maine roasting over the last decade or so, are starting to be mirrored in our estuaries as well. And we're just looking at the bottom to fill in that that OA chemistry data, um, get good accurate PCO2 measurements from our system, and also learn what other parameters um, we should be measuring um, again to kind of get the most bang for our buck and have the best information to inform um, folks that are working in our estuaries. So these are hitting folks like um, aquaculture folks in our stories use our water quality data. Um, I'm sure the shellfish growers and the oyster folks would be very interested in aragonite thresholds and things like that. We're just not quite there yet. So our continued collaborations, um, let me see if I can get this thing out of my way. There we go. So our current and future collaborations right now, we're doing some equipment testing and lab work with Dr. Hunt down at the CML UNH lab. Um, again, he has a system down there. We call it the tank of science. Um, where he has some different technology for measuring dissolved carbon in, in the water. And we've been looking at how our sensors, both our own, our friends of Casco Bay sensors, and his units are reading the same environment. And again, we found that we were seeing quite a bit of difference even in individual sensors. So both of these sensors were um, recently, more recently calibrated than not. And um, as you can see, when the, when the readings first start off, there's quite a bit of variation in our readings on a scale, as well as a little bit of a delay in when we're seeing our peaks in PCO2. And again, this is following a tidal cycle at the CML lab. What we found is as those instruments were left in the water and left to acclimate longer, that data got tighter and tighter and tighter. 
Um, so again, a little technical here, but this is getting into some of the things that I worry about as a data collector, making sure that the data coming off of our sensors is actually usable and, um, and, and giving us a good, uh, a good uh, story about what's actually happening in the environment. So um, we've recently got some um, funds awarded with Friends of Casco Bay through what's called the Broad Reach Funds. I think last webinar, Ivy Franyoka, one of our colleagues at Friends of Casco Bay, um, talked about this opportunity. So I'm not gonna dwell on it because you guys heard a little bit about that, but we're really excited to be involved with this team. I'm part, and Jason as well, as part of the tech team, which was formed, the tech team, to try to get at these exact questions. Um, we wanna be able to leave this grant um, and this project with kind of a um, uh, inform agencies or others looking to start collecting some kind of carbonate chemistry data on, listen, what's the best bang for your buck here? Um, if you have a little bit of funding or if you have a lot of funding, should you go for a whole system of continuous monitoring probes or should you be focused on getting grab samples to look at alkalinity and aragonite or something like that? I'm just trying to have a couple options for people. So when you get into this kind of uh, um, a quite complicated world of carbonate chemistry and estuaries, we can kind of... Um, figure out and hone in on some of the better um, techniques and things that we can collect again, get the best bang for our buck. I hate to keep saying that that phrase, but it is um, what it is. And of course, all the other data that we need to look at too, like the uh, salinity and how that's affecting things. So um, just quickly, some challenges and next steps, you know, continued funding, of course, to maintain equipment, to purchase new equipment. These sensors, especially accurate pH sensors are not cheap. Um, having redundant sensors so we don't have data gaps and um, we can keep equipment moving in and out. And what types of sensors to buy? Again, we've had some really hard lessons learned with the Turner C Sense that equipment's not going to be serviced or offered anymore. So we're at a crossroads of figuring out if we want to collect PCO2, what did that equipment look like, as well as what type of bench top um, testing and other lab um, parameters can we look at to kind of ground truth some of the things that we're collecting. So pH measurements, alkalinity, all that kind of stuff. And of course, making sure that we're thinking about how we interpret and analyze this data you know, in light of all the inherent noise um, that's associated with estuary and water quality data, we see huge fluctuations in seasonality, productivity, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, make, uh, painting a picture of how our coastal water chemistry is affecting open ocean acidification, I think is a really important and maybe underappreciated um, um, step in this whole, whole thing. And then, of course, developing this regional approach to coastal and ocean observing, right? Um, that benefits end users. Um, I think the goal here is to get things into the hands of users that can actually use it to, to inform their management or their, um, um, you know, whatever they might be doing in the environment. So um, again, just to wrap up here quickly, because I know we're probably a little over, so that we feel like the nearest swap, it's a well-funded continuous monitoring program that's in place. We have existing infrastructure that's well-funded into the future, and we have existing users who are already looking um, for OA, OA data and, and more um, carbonate chemistry data. And adding those additional CO parameters to that existing program, I think limits the need from starting from scratch. So again, these data platforms are already in place, they're powered, um, we have what we need at the sites. Um, we just need the equipment and we need the knowledge to understand how to best collect this data and what parameters will be um, uh, most useful in analyzing um, coastal and ocean acidification chemistry from the lens of an estuary. And um, that's kind of what I have for you. Um, I hope that was beneficial or helpful to some of you folks in taking a little bit of a, a look at our coastal um, efforts here in Southern Maine. And Jason, if I missed anything, I know it's hard to get a word in there edgewise because I just get rolling, but uh, uh, my colleague and our research director, Jason Goldstein, has also uh, been a huge help with all of this and uh, I'll let him chime in real quick. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I don't want to take up um, any more time on the presentation, but I think just to underscore the, the broad reach funds that we have in tandem with Friends of Casco Bay and with uh, Chris Hunt at UNH are going to be really helpful for us to identify, um, you know, a decision making tree, essentially, and the criteria that people should be using or could be using, uh, you know, to, so to select instrumentation and, you know, how to do those, how to, you know, build out those observational assets at a particular site, whether it's at a National Marine Sanctuary site or an estuarine site or, you know, um, some other long-term infrastructure that's already in place. So um, we wanted, and care of Jeremy, we really wanted to just give you our SWAMP program as one potential example model for how that could work and how OA carbonate chemistry could be integrated. So I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the NECAN steering committee first um, to see if they have any questions. But I just wanted to remind everybody um, we encourage questions from everybody else. So just use the, the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen or put it right in the chat. Um, but I'll turn it over to Beth uh, first. Wow, guys, this was great. This was really fantastic. I have a lot of questions. I'll try not to dominate everything. Um, so um, number one to Jeremy and Jason, I do think this decision tree is a tremendous thing to aim for. I think that would be such a help to so many programs. So I'm eager to see how that, how that develops. Um, Jeremy, you said that you have users eager for OA data. Um, who are these people and why do they want it? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my biggest examples would probably be um, our shellfish aquaculture folks in our harbor who are already looking at our pH data and temperature data and stuff that's coming from the swamp program right there. And um, yeah, hoping for something that's a little bit more like when can I get an alarm that when a certain parameter dips to a certain level, um, I can, and, I, and you know that I was actually really interested in hearing um, Sarah, I believe, talk about pH limits on surf clams, um, that would be something I'd be really, if you can share that resource or that um, literature would be great because I've always understood that things like aragonite saturation and, and, you know, really using pH to get at growth scales wasn't always all that usable. So being able to use a parameter like pH as a, maybe an alarm or a signal that your shellfish might be in some kind of stress would be super useful. But that's one great example I can think of. The other is my partners at DEP, Angela Brewer um, at the Department of Environmental Protection who heads the Marine Unit there. Um, again, uh, in, in, um, getting into some SAV, um, so, so submerged aquatic vegetation monitoring, and I would be really interested in some more localized alkalinity and um, finer scale pH and PCO2 data when it comes to that stuff. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just build on that. Um, those are two perfect ap applications. But the other one is, uh, as Jeremy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, is, is the, the dearth of information that we already have, that we have on carbonate chemistry just in very shallow water systems like estuaries and bays and inlets. We, we just, we don't have a very good idea how that, how carbonate chemistry interacts with some of these other parameters even something as simple as temperature, dissolved oxygen, dissolved inorganics, um, all kinds of things, nutrients, things that we're already collecting. Um, so doing these side by side, having, you know, having that um, uh, build out of carbonate chemistry in tandem that you can pair with these, um, these other parameters is really important. And then you know, the other thing is just choosing the right instrumentation to get the job done. And that's something that Jeremy has been working really hard on. And it's it's a work in progress because, and you know, Chris, I don't know if Chris Hunt's on this call, but he can speak to this way better than I can. Um, and I'll embarrass myself by saying, I don't, I don't know all the nuances of all these different pieces of equipment and the sensors and how they're working, you know, sort of at the, you know, it, it, the, the guts of this, but there are big differences in how those data get collected. Um, and so having the right package, the sweet, right suite of instrumentation to do that is not trivial. And that's one of the things that we're, we're really trying to stress and work on. Yeah, we heard a lot of that from Ivy last week as well. Um, so I also have um, questions for Sarah. Um, hopefully you're still there. Um, so that was a great um summary of the mid-atlantic um does the new england council use the same kind of um uh, iea and, and mse process they have a different process that they're working on for ebfm they're actually looking more at kind of um managing sort of aggregate groups of species and sort of system caps and things like that um, but they do receive the same ecosystem report that uh that the Mid-Atlantic receives. And I, they were, I mean, I think I, we, we developed a um, mock-up sort of risk assessment for them, what that would look like there too. And they also obviously have all of the same information from the um, climate vulnerability analysis, which is the main sort of 
tie-in of uh, ocean acidification and species that we have for that's comprehensive for the region. Um, so they don't have the same like risk assessment, conceptual model, MSE type of loop. That's, that's the MIDS ecosystem approach. And I had a couple of questions from Sam Sedlecki who had to leave um, before. Um, these were also for you, Sarah. Um, so she wonders if the time series that um, would be useful for fisheries, are they integrated over a, a spatial area or are they from one particular location? And how do you decide where those time series are most effective? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we struggle with that for all of our indicators, I think, because we're trying to report at the scale that like stocks are managed, but obviously the dynamics are happening at different scales. Um, so I, I could see something like the way we present, we do our temperature indicators as like this sort of aggregate, you know, seasonal or annual temperature, but then we also do try to have at least a seasonal snapshot on a map at the resolution that we're able to do that. And so I could see sort of a, a overall ocean acidification, maybe a bit of a wash. Um, bottom acidification, I think would be more relevant. Um, and the type of information we're getting from the gliders right now is really excellent because that's all very spatially um, you know, discrete and you can see where it's happening. But then people are like, well, how's that changing over time? And <laughs> so we, we get the similar questions. Um, I think maybe the way to do it would be to concentrate on particular species and particular habitats that are really important for those species and then highlight trends in those areas, perhaps. That could be one way of approaching it. Um, obviously, scallops is something everyone's really concerned about from a revenue standpoint for, for the whole Northeast US coast, but also lobsters and surf clams and all of those. And on, on Jeremy's question, I have to look up the reference, but so the pH comparison is what we presented in the 2022 report. And then the um, aragonite, I think they considered to be just easier to match up with obviously physiological thresholds. But I can, Shannon Misek is the one who would know about the specific research. I think it's published, but I can't remember. And I was just trying to look it up, but I don't have the bandwidth to like do a Google search <laughs> and be on Zoom right now, <laughs> unfortunately, right, no sorry. <laughs> um, That's okay. But yeah, I should be able to get that information because I think all of it is of interest. Like, you know, how is this impacting the species and where is it happening? Like identifying those thresholds and maybe even showing like where the thresholds have been hit on a map perhaps, or, you know, what is the spatial extent could be something like the indicator, like, okay, we, we hit thresholds in, you know, a very small proportion of the total area occupied by a particular species or the total habitat of concern. Um, how long was it there? So we do a sort of extreme events um, indicator for temperature as well, heat waves. So it's kind of detrended this year. So we've taken out the climate change signal and just looking at the extreme events, I could see maybe a similar approach like within a year for something like acidification, if we could identify it in certain areas or like I, I can see a lot of potential ways forward for this. And I'm really excited to see the sort of systematic measurement that, um, that Tammy and Jeremy were presenting because I think that's, that's kind of what we need and maybe what we're lacking at the large scale at the moment. I don't know if that answered the question. And if I may just interject quickly, um, yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think as the lab studies continue to increase about animals and their reaction to lower PCO2 levels and stuff, even things that might not be experiencing the environment. I was lucky enough to be in San Diego this past year at a larval fish conference, a little side um, passion of mine, and heard Hans Bohm's talk on um, the larval uh, sand lance and how important that is, Stalwagen, and I have quite a collection of larval sand lance at my lab that I've been looking at since 2008 coming into our estuary. And again, just being able to maybe tie in, um, I've taken measurements on all those sand lances, lengths, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it might be the near shore one, I understand there's two species, so I'm not sure if it's complete, but you know, uh, uh, very pertinent um, understanding how maybe our coastal acidification is affecting the growth rates of some of these more near shore larval species like that would be so powerful 
to um, put OA data into the management sector. So that's the kind of stuff that gets me excited <laughs> about OA data. And I got to say, I found myself cursing myself the other day because I really struggled through organic chemistry in, in my college career. I remember getting out of that class with my C going, I'll never use this stuff ever. <laughs> I mean, here I am, damn you, Professor. <laughs> you got me. I'm doing, I'm doing organic chemistry. <laughs> Um, I had one more question for Sarah from Sam. Um, so the, on, in the MSC process, um, what's the time scale that those uh, run on? Are they, uh, do you do an MSC for different species with bivalves living for decades versus, you know, forage fish that live a year or a couple of years? Yeah, also an excellent question. And so you would tailor the analysis to the, the management question and the stock or the, you know, the issue. So. Um, that particular one, I think it, typically with an MSE, you're looking at sort of the long-term performance of something. And so you would be sort of running the model out until all of the different factors have kind of had a chance to play out and then ask, you know, how did my different management measures work in the long term? People are also very interested in short-term transitions though. So if you're like doing management one way and then you suddenly change it, what happens? Um, so there, increasingly that type of question is being asked too, but I think you would design it so that like something like a forage species would have a much shorter time step, something like a summer flounder that lives a lot longer. For example, I think we were doing like um, 25 year forecast runs that would have, you know, that would encompass like a dozen assessment cycles if you did assessments every other year and would look at the rec how the recreational measures played out over that. And so the, the change in distribution is played out over that kind of time frame too. But I, I think the method has a lot of flexibility to be adjusted for the particular objectives and the stocks and the information going into it. So like if you did an MSC on bacteria, <laughs> you would run it on a really <laughs> different time set, right? Right, um, right? But yeah, it's got a lot of flexibility. And those are run with Atlantis, those um, MSCs? They don't, they don't have to be. Um, you could do that. Atlantis is sometimes, uh, Atlantis is an ecosystem model. For those who don't know, it's end-to-end -end ecosystem model that basically starts with physics and goes through fisheries. And so uh, run time on an Atlantis, well, development time on an Atlantis model can be five years to decades. And run time on an Atlantis model can be, you know, 12 hours for a single run. So you probably don't want to use Atlantis unless you really need it. Um, a lot of the management strategy evaluations that we see are trying to uh, build models from sort of existing parts and putting them together to address the question and the uncertainties for that question with the understanding that we're not going to get all the other side effects that might happen from this. So it's usually a balance between trying to address the objectives and bringing in as much of the uncertainties in the ecosystem as you need for the question. Um, trying to model the whole thing becomes a bit cumbersome and and may not get you an answer on the management time frame where people usually want an answer, you know, six months to a year, not 25 years. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Right. Thanks. I, uh, I don't want to take up all the time, so hopefully other people have questions as well. Hi, maybe I ask a question. This is Tamika Scott from BIO in Canada. I think Jeremy brought up the questions which we always uh, wonder, what's the best sensors for the right place and right spot? Um, coastal and offshore definitely have a different sensor requirements. An estuary type of place, by filing is big, and you have to actually calibrate quite often with discrete water samples. And the uh, question is, how often you actually collect water to calibrate well? So. Oh, Jeremy, you went on mute. You were unmuted and then you oh, muted real quick. There we go. Gotcha. <laughs> so uh, that was one of our big lessons learned over 2020, 2021 was that um, the sensor data is not very useful without matching up grab samples and looking at alkalinity and everything else. So. Um, what we're starting to do with our broad reach funds is we're going to be doing, I believe we said monthly um, sampling for alkalinity to start with, um, three to four times monthly when I go to swap my 
data sound will be grabbing those grabs, pulling the sensor, downloading data, incorporating that in. Uh, we have Chris Hunt down at UNH who's going to do all of the lab titrations for us for uh, both alkalinity, benchtop pH, and I believe uh, potentially aragonite as well. So this will be a new um, a new technique for me, poisoning samples in the field, making sure that I'm not getting a lot of gas exchange, um, NISCAN sampling. So thank you for bringing that up. And yes, this is going to be a big learning experience for us. So again, first year of data collection was a little bit of open the door, drop the sensor and see what happens. And Ooh. <laughs> some lessons learned. Yeah, and Chris is an expert of this, but uh, estuarian system have a different carbonic chemistry system. You have a lot of organic alkalinity, which is not seen offshore. So it's a very different um, system. So it would be interesting to see actually a time series on that aspect too. But we calibration and clean up the sensor. <laughs> excuse me, which we do, we usually go to the site every two weeks or something. If you do coastal and clean up the surface of the sensors, that's what we do and download data. So you know that it's working. That's right. Yeah, no, those are all great points. And again, great lessons we learned the hard way out in our estuary, thinking we could get away with 30 day deployments. And as you saw with our sensor, once the foul and kicked up um, on the cage and around the sensor, it's just really makes your data not too useful. So challenging environment to monitor in. I've been learning that over the last 17 years with our basic equipment, which actually has great anti-fouling um, things added into them. You know, the wide size sensors now come brushed and have copper tape, and there's all sorts of things we can do to try to decrease some of that interference with our data, but points well taken and something I look forward to improving on in this next kind of um, step in our journey when we start working with Chris and get some new instrumentation. And um, we're, we're finding that we'll have to pay a little closer attention, especially in these highly productive environments. Yeah. And Sarah and Tammy's talk, I, I was really uh, impressed how com comprehensive the reports are. And uh, one question is how you actually evaluate the community effect. Um, the temperature, pH, oxygen, those things work sometimes synergetic way, sometimes opposite direction. Do you evaluate that? I'll go real quick and I'll let Tammy probably is doing more with this. So at the moment, we are not yet because the level of our report is so broad that um, impacts to diff like different species have different thresholds, et cetera, et cetera. However, I think one of the things we do want to explore is more of an integrative type of indicator, more of like a, a metabolic type of indicator that would integrate the conditions of temperature and oxygen at the very least and that that's being worked on in some of our West Coast reports. Um, so you could start to identify thresholds that might be useful across species, and then we could communicate something like that. So it's something that we absolutely consider, and I think you're able to do at the species level probably more easily than at the sort of system level, but I think I, there's a lot of really cool stuff up at Stellwagen, so I will stop. Yeah, in our condition report, when we come up with our with our ratings and trends, it, it's actually not really quantitative. It was based on our expert workshops so where everyone kind of weighs in with, with their opinion and we come to a consensus on a rating um, and trend. And then we also look at how confident we are in that trend. So, you know, we looked at, I think like eight foundational species or eight focal species and then a few foundational species at Sandlands being a, a foundational species and look at each one separately and then kind of combine them to look at the overall rating of how the focal and foundational species are doing. <laughs> 